period, that word kept swirling around in my head. What was this period that was causing me to bleed? And why was this bleeding shrouded in such mystery? With no clear answers, I trudged through what was a very uncomfortable day. I kept imagining that everyone knew that I was bleeding and was scared stiff of being touched by boys. I might as well have stayed home because all the lessons in class that day all went over my head. Shannon Fogwa, everybody. <laughs> and she is reading an excerpt from her book, yeah. My First Time, yeah. which is now available um, around the country textbook center. Yeah. Um, and today we get to discuss her book. <laughs> Welcome to Living With Us, everybody. I'm Sharon Wendia, and we are at Hub House. Um, and this is our very first Living With Us book club. Yeah. Right? And our pick, it was an obvious one for us, had to be My First Time Stories. Yay. Janet Bogwai. Pretty sure you're familiar with her. She is a journalist by profession. She is a mother. She is a gender equality advocate and a content creator. Um, and now we add author. Yes. I can't believe it. Oh my gosh. Thank you, Sharon, oh. first of all, for all the incredible work you do and for being a part of my first time. Yeah. But yeah, I love the bit of we add author. It took me a minute, by the way, and call it imposter syndrome. Yeah. Until somebody was like, just say, I'm yeah. a published author. You're a published so author. So now I can say that when I'm introducing myself oh, and, I'm, wow. and I'm really proud of it. Yeah, I'm proud of it too. <laughs> like, and not just even the book, but everything that you've been doing, especially yeah. in the me uh, menstrual health management space. Yes. Um, so. Let's dive into mm -hmm. the book club and having conversations around my first time. So if you've not yet picked up the book, one, what, what's happening? <laughs> Come on, pick it up, yeah. read it, gift it to every um, girl in your life, but also boys as well. I think mm -hmm. this is an important book to them. But the gist of it is that you had 50 women mm -hmm. share their stories. Yes. Right? Actually, I should let you see. Yeah. What so is it? I... Um, it, it's 50, so it's just over 50 and then some men. Right, yes. Which yeah. was a bit of a last minute decision. Uh -huh. Not really last, I wasn't sure. If I'm to think about the genesis, and please excuse me, I'm <laughs> battling a cold. <laughs> if you hear the sniffles, <laughs> it's not so much emotion. <laughs> it's a cold. It's a cold. <laughs> it's a cold. Okay. Um, I've been in the space of menstrual advocacy for a few years. I started in Nuadada Foundation a few years ago yeah. and was out of addressing an immediate need, which was girls need pads in school. Mm. So at the time, I still was coming to grips with that whole space. I just knew I was triggered that girls didn't have pads, that they were using unsanitary products and started the foundation. It was largely intervention like distribution of pads and underwear mm. and really pushing the government for a bigger budgetary allocation. Over the years, it became a lot about advocacy and awareness and using the media to mainstream the conversation. And I can say that from 2013, there's been a huge leap in mainstreaming it, starting with that feature that aired about periods of shame, a TV feature about girls using unsanitary products. Yeah. So fast forward a few years and I kept feeling like every time I was doing intervention, there were still so many question marks. Right. If you go to a school and girls have never seen pads before, uh -huh. um, boys, I would rather, they just want the ground to swallow them. Mm. And I just kept thinking, what's missing here? There's an awareness uh, advocacy bit that's missing. And how can we make this conversation normalized in a way that people kind of, it's, it'll take a while, but how do we start? Mm. Now, I am a sucker for storytelling. I love storytelling. It's a powerful tool. Um, to just, it's a face, putting a face to an issue for me has always been a very strong way of bringing the issue to life. Yeah. So I thought to myself, what if we collected stories on people experiencing their period? It started as a very simple thing, let's collect stories. Then I thought, hmm, let's collect diverse stories. Because okay. initially it was just going to be maybe people I know. Yeah. Then I thought, what about people who are locked out of the conversation? Uh -huh. Then I thought, what about men? So I sat down and said, okay, this is clearly going to be a project. I got goosebumps. I don't know why I'm getting it. <laughs> no. like, I know the story, but I... I <laughs> but yeah, but yeah the, the yeah. journey. No, it's, and so I, then I thought, how do I want these stories to be told? I could have done it in any other medium. Yeah. Why a book? I wanted a resource tool that can live in school libraries, in yeah. the workplace. I wanted that years from now, there's a reference point for girls and boys to see themselves. Yeah. And so that informed the inclusion aspect of the people in the book. Thought about people who you don't usually, the stories you don't usually hear, women who are differently abled, a woman who's blind, yeah. um, 
an imam, yeah, like a man oh, who calls good. men to that prayer. Was interesting. Yeah, I, I was so I was so excited yeah. when he agreed. I said, "Really, you're yeah. going to?" And he literally came from prayers and wow. came to do the shoot. Right. Um, and so the way I did it was, I called all of you. I can, you know, say Sharon's also in the book. Yeah. And kind of did this portrait series. And why? I felt like I really wanted it to be a very proudly African project. I feel like a lot of the time our stories are told for us. I'm like, we can tell our stories and this is how. So, and then the creative in me was like, I wanted everyone to kind of be in theme, wear white because there's a right. period to the transition yeah. and the red really just speaks to the theme of yeah. the book. Yeah. And so that's how it came together. But it was interesting trying to get people. Some people were like, I would love to do the book. Just don't show my face. Oh. Yes, because it's oh, still... Right, because there's still shame and stigma around... There you go. ...something that is so normal. It's so normal. It's um, yeah. every month for yeah. like another 30, 40 years of yeah. our lives. And so that's how I ended up with these particular people. They were not afraid to show their faces, right. to raise their voices, um, and to just share in their experiences. Yeah. And, and yeah, that's how I ended up coming up with just over 50 people, because some of them are in groups. Right. Like over oh, 25 the is the four of them, the yeah. twins, yeah, the sisters, twins. Yeah. exactly. Yeah. So close to 60 people oh wow yeah Ooh, okay so <laughs> let's start off with your first time story which is actually how the well there's a there's a forward i think um yes by there's the, a forward by jenna dean jenna dean and the first lady and the first lady endorsed yeah. it by writing yeah. a message which was also an just an incredible opportunity yeah. i didn't know that they'd say yes oh, i just gosh. said it would be great with all the work you do okay yeah because <laughs> it's it's something that that she does so yeah. yes it starts with the the preface and then the forward and then the message yes and then my story and then your story <laughs> is yes. what sets it uh, yeah. off and so I, I i figure we might as well just do a quick recap okay um and i'm going to read this it's actually on page one yes um and you say what i thought was the start of an ordinary day eerily turned tense as i slowly opened my eyes a strange sensation overwhelmed me I wiggled my body ever so slightly in my bed, and it felt like I was swimming in some slippery substance. I cautiously peered under my sheets. They were blood-soaked. Shock and confusion instantly gripped me. Oh my God, what's happening to me? That part, for me, yeah. first of all, I want to understand, before that, mm -hmm. Did you have any conversations? Had you had anyone spoken to you about your period? No. Because from your reaction, it's like, I'm dying, which a number of people. A number of people say yeah, that in the say, book. Yeah, like they approach their parents like, mom, we need, in fact, one went to hospital. Yes. And it's only when, like, they were coming back that the mom was like, you oh, didn't need to need do to that. Get. And that's, and yeah, I love so your question. Me, yeah. Like, I, I didn't know. I was 10. So my mom was also shocked because she right. said, oh, um, um, okay, because my sister started at um, 13. Yeah, your older sister. My older sister. Yeah. And so I just, the first thing I remember when I think about it was going shopping with my older cousins. My cousins would come from Nairobi. I grew up in Mombasa and they'd stay at our place. And I remember this one time going to a supermarket and they were kind of trying to hide whatever they bought. Uh. Um, and I just, I, I didn't see the full packet, but I remember seeing a little bit of color like just the yes, tip of yeah, the yeah, package yeah. and saying, what's that? And they said, oh, you do not need to know about this. And yeah. that was, I think I was maybe eight or nine. Yeah. Then fast forward to another one or two years and no one had ever talked to me about it. I think they figured you're still young. We'll tell you at like maybe 12. I yeah. don't know. So I had no idea. I did not know what period was. I did not know what was happening to me. Genuinely thought uh, my body was under some kind of attack. And so I remember going to my mom and then she was a little shocked because she thought, I thought I had time, yeah. maybe another year or two before I, and so it was really quick. It was like, okay, here's pads. Don't let boys touch you. Go to school. Right. So even in school, I was traumatized. And it's only like in the book, in my story that I say, it's the way I was walking that one of my classmates was like, oh, ah, you started your period. And she was the only other person who had. Yeah. Um, so it was problematic for a while. I was quite traumatized. I was quite shocked. I was embarrassed. Yeah. I went home and that evening, my oh, dad was dad like, congratulations. Yeah. I wanted to die. Oh gosh. I was like, mom, why? Yeah. <laughs> and so that's 
planted the seed of it's not a bad thing. Right. And it's only when I was a teenager that I thought, okay, now everyone around me right. has started. Yeah. But it was shocking. Right. Yeah. You know, there's two things, two memories that came to me that I'd completely forgotten right. um, when you were speaking. And one was um, we'd gone for a funeral and then I think my cousins had kind of were starting, they wanted to use a bathroom mm -hmm. and they were kind of lining up and someone was handing them something. One of the older cousins was handing them something. Mm -hmm. And I tried for the life of me to just get them to tell me, what are you handing out? Yeah. Can I please see? It just looked fascinating. Yeah. And it's only years later that I was like, it must oh, have been pads exactly. that they were handing out. Um, and the second thing was, I remember after starting my period, suddenly it was like there was always an always ad or like a, ta like a pad ad yes. on TV. Yes. And I'd just be like, everyone in the house is looking at me. They all oh, know. They can sense yeah. it. <laughs> and there was just that kind of fear. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm, I'm curious, when did you, because you also talk about um, a, mm -hmm. a point at which you kind of overcame mm -hmm. the shame and the stigma mm -hmm. um, and, and recalibrated what period, what your period was for you. Right. How did you get to that point where it no longer felt terrifying yeah. or, or even shameful that you needed to hide? How did you get to the point where you're writing a book, exactly. talking about it, <laughs> pulling men into these conversations? Right. What That's a really steps? good question. I think the first step was, if I'm to think about just the years following, it still, it took a while. And then I think when I was about 16 and I was aware, the other problem came when I started struggling with my period, excessive bleeding, a lot uh -huh. of pain. And I remember times when I would be um, in, the, um, in the matron's office because I was in boarding school and I'd have to, there was once or twice, it wasn't as regular as a lot of girls suffered, but there's once or twice I couldn't go to class mm -hmm. because I was in mm -hmm. immense pain. Mm -hmm. And then that kind of continued on and off throughout college until once, um, it was 2005, I think I was right smack in the middle of uni, and I came home for the holidays because I studied outside the country, and I said, something is very wrong. Yeah. This can't be normal. I mean, a lot of pain. I was curious enough because a lot of women and girls normalize the pain. Yeah. I think I was maybe, for some reason, exposed enough to say, this can't be normal, and I don't like pain. Yeah. Just generally. <laughs> I just, I hate pain. So I thought, this pain has to be addressed. Yeah. <laughs> and I can't keep self-medicating. We, <laughs> we need to fix this. We need to fix this. So I went and that's the first time I was introduced to a gynecologist. Right. That was my first um, appointment. And he said, you have ovarian cysts. I said, what, what does that even mean? He said, yeah, there's little growths outside um, around your uterus. So we need to burn them. The whole thing just sounded very odd. I said, am I going to survive is all I yeah. need to know. He's like, no, there's this, this thing called a laparoscopy. At the time, it was, I don't think it was new, but it wasn't as popular as it is now. Okay. He's like, it won't, it'll be non-invasive. We'll just like put a tube in. We'll, you know, kind of took me through the medical bit. Yeah. And you'll be fine. You'll walk out of here today. Like, wow. you're not going to be admitted. Yeah. I said, that sounds really awesome. So he did that, and I was okay. But the pain kind of came back about a year later. So when I went and saw now the next gynecologist who's since delivered my two sons. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, and he's like, you're struggling with endometriosis. That's what you have. And I said, but it's uh, never heard of it. And obviously now we know how yeah. much, it, it, much it affects people. Yeah. And he said, for you, the only thing that will help you manage your excessive bleeding and excess pain is going on birth control. Uh -huh. um, and I said, okay, and what next? And he said, maybe when you have children, I was like, I don't know, 15 years ago. I'm like, yeah. I stopped him. I'm like, but I'm not yeah, looking I mean, at having children yeah. right now. Right. He said, maybe then your cycle will change. Before then you have to manage it. There's really nothing I can do. Or in the sense of there's no quick fix. Right. It's something that has to be managed. And so literally that's how I started. And it stayed with me. I'm like, why is my period so problematic? I can't be the only person. Also, this can't be just me. There must be other people going through this, how do we, and that kind of planted the seed and my curiosity for how is this period disruptive for me who has access? And it kind of stayed at the back of my head because it's even then, birth control really helped. Had my sons, it actually got worse. Your I'm, period, your pain? Uh, the pain yeah. without birth control because I'm like, ah, yeah. I've had children, I'm yeah, a ninja, yeah, yeah. oh my oh, goodness. Gosh. And so I'm like, you know what? We need to have this conversation. Yeah. So to your question, that was kind of the journey of, I've always had a problematic period. Um, I'm lucky I have access to the right medical 
you know, medicine and doctors, but how do we mainstream this conversation? Oh, and then I started asking women, what was your period like? And yeah. I'd always be like, you know, I started at 10. They said, what? That's so young. Yeah. I started at 12, 13. I was shocked. I was happy. Different things. And I was just very fascinated. And then that kind of planted the seed again going further. When I got into advocacy, I went back to those stories never left me of just different people's experiences. Mm. Why don't we put them in a book? Because now I have the know-how, I have the exposure, I understand what my issues are and how to address them. Let's open up the conversation. Oh, wow. And so it's incredible to see that <laughs> every time somebody says they've picked up the book, it takes them back to their first yeah, experience, yeah. makes them think about other people's experiences. It's a conversation I think people have wanted to have for a long time. Right. And this was just my way of let's have a tool to open up the conversation. Right, and yeah. so that's essentially what I wanted to do. Oh, Janet, bless you, because even as you were speaking, I didn't, re and I'm, I'd like to think that I am a well-traveled, like exposed, yes. modern woman, yeah. but it's only now that it hit me. I can't believe that I, because I also went on the pill when I was right. in university, and it was only after my friend was like, you can't be missing school, because mm. um, I'd missed like two, three days in uni yeah. because of my period, and I was in pain diarrhea, oh. vomiting. It just, it was excruciating. I couldn't go yeah. out of a crowd. And she's the one who told me. But I never once even thought to ask yeah. a doctor. I just kind of went to the school mm. nurse and I explained what I needed. And she was like, oh yeah, that makes sense. Mm. But I, I mean, even now I'm learning. Yeah. I, di I didn't try to pursue that a little bit more to understand. And, yeah. and yet I normalized it too. I just assumed there you, go. you just need, you feel this kind of pain where even mm. in high school I'd be like, oh, Janet. Wow. No, but Thank you know what you. you said, Sharon, is so important because wow. it's even a conversation I had the other day with a group of women. Yeah. We're just used to normalizing pain. Why? First of all, as Why? women, we're taught, familiar. you're a woman, you've got this. I'm glad it's changing to yeah. some extent. Yeah. But there's that notion of you're not the first person to have gone through it, so wing it. Right. Also, this can't be as bad. Right. I've not been admitted. I can... I'm having a bad day, yeah. let me take medication and go, but we shouldn't normalize No, pain. no, not, and it's, if I remember what it felt, it just was It was bad. But yeah. it changed for me, it changed after pregnancy. Okay. Um, <laughs> during the break, I was telling her, I can't believe I'm sitting here and it's only now I'm still re like learning things about my body from the conversation we're having yeah. before. And, and even taking, you know, going from what you said about your first time experience and not being very aware. And I, as I was going through the book and the other women's stories, there were many who had no idea what was happening to their bodies. Mm. How do we normalize this for our girls, mm. for our boys? Because there were a lot of boys as well who were like, ha ha, yeah. there's a stain on your dress. Exactly. Um, and when is the right age to have these conversations? Really important questions. I think to normalize it, we first of all, need to educate the educators. <laughs> uh, so parents and teachers need to be comfortable with the conversation. We right. find that a lot of the time, teachers, because of how they've been socialized, surrounded with the stigma and the taboo, mm. don't really know how to articulate it. So you find that the stigma is already, um, it, the socialization is already there. Mm. It's not a blame game, it's just simply what it is. Yeah. They grew up being told, you do not talk about this publicly, and suddenly you're supposed to teach it, so there needs to be an unlearning. Parents as well. Yeah. Even parents who are buying this book are telling me, yeah, you've made it simple for me, because yeah. I didn't really know where to start. Right. So we need to educate the, the sort of like the caregivers, so that when, by the time they're communicating this information, yeah. they're not doing it when it's shrouded with stigma and shame. Right. Um, yes, boys also need to be included. So I'm sure you can remember, and you've heard it before, and it's even in the book, when these um, organizations came to schools, the boys were told, please leave. leave. We only yeah. want to talk to the yeah. girls. Um, I'm actually supposed to be starting school tours soon. And one school had suggested the same thing for me. Like, yeah. oh, we're not really sure to mix it up yet. And I said, I'll, I'll let you off easy, but I haven't let one or two others. I'm like, can we just try and have it that we're all in the same yeah. room? We're trying to find an easy way to incorporate the conversation that everyone can be involved. So we're still trying to explore it. Right. It's already still, a, this is 2020, my book is out, and people are still like, oh, can we separate the girls and yeah. boys? And I'm like, it's reinforcing the stigma, but I get that it'll take a while. So I think it will take um, educating the public in terms of age appropriate. Girls are starting their period at eight and nine, mm. which is 
I find that so heartbreaking because I'm like, you're such a little child. Yeah, to be able to, like, <laughs> to, to handle like, that I shock. I can't go swimming. I know. I can't, like, yeah. you know, that must be a lot. But I think most early. people are doing it from class five. So 10, 11, 12 onwards seems to be in schools. It's home science. You're told about the reproductive, um, your reproductive organs and um, uh, what's happening to your body. And then it's like the rest study for your exams. Yeah. It's not a very holistic conversation about yeah. this is what's happening. If you're feeling tired or if you're feeling moody, there's a hormonal imbalance. That's important to say. Yeah. Some girls have no idea why. Yeah. They they're just, tired. they're tired, yeah. they're fatigued, heavy bleeding. Yeah. So of course you're, you're, you're losing a lot of, you need supplements maybe sometimes. That conversation isn't really happening. So the hope is that now that this is becoming more of a mainstream conversation and the government is also kind of rallying behind it, we can find ways to make it more holistic in schools. It has to mm. start in schools. It has to start in the home. Right. Parents also need to be able to sit and say, you're now 10, 11, 12 years old. We need to have this conversation. What have you heard about periods? Let your child respond and then say, okay, this is essentially what's happening in your body. How does that make you feel? Like be very intentional. Try and draw a lot out. Don't talk at the person, mm. uh, at the child for so long. Engage them. Because by now they've heard. Yeah. They're 12, 13, maybe they've heard about it if oh, they're 11. Yeah, for sure. Try and just engage them on what do they know. So they might bring up some stigmas like I'm not allowed to be in the same room as boys when I'm on my period. Because yeah. there's so many myths. Yeah. I mean, there are countries in India, women are not allowed into the temple because they're dirty. Right. And I know that there's huge activism there around that. Don't even go far. In parts of Kenya, you're not allowed to be in the man's um, hut space. or home or yeah, space. Yeah. You're not allowed to cook. Yeah. You're not allowed to do this or do that because you're unclean. So let's let's begin to also teach our children. That's those are just myths because people don't know how to deal with the you know the, the right. issue. But it has to be in the homes and schools. Otherwise, they're going to learn it from their peers, which isn't terrible, but it's not the best place it's not to the start. Best. Yeah, because they don't have yeah. the experience. Yeah, yeah. or they'll just be shocked and yep. kind. Of, some even kept it from their. I think one of the ladies said they kept yeah. it from their mom, from for their a mom year or something. One even I kept thought. it for years. Beatrice Wafula, who yeah. is a huge advocate in the space yeah. who brought this story to the TV yeah. was like, I kept it from my mom and I just wish I hadn't because she ended up and she says it, she ended up developing fibroids right. that have made her unable to have children. She right. talks about it. Yeah. She's like, I just wish I told somebody because they would have maybe told me that what I'm going through is not normal. Right. And I wish I hadn't kept it this. from my mom. Right. Exactly. And yeah. I even like how, you know, Ta I think it's Tatiana Karanja who shares her story and she says that she was familiar with periods because her, she would she would be in the bathroom when her mom was either taking a pad or a tampon. I don't yes. know what it was. And I love that that you're also it's normalized. So it's exactly. not like oh, hide your pads, put them in a drawer that's far in the back. <laughs> yeah, that don't no show one boys. can ever see. Exactly. There you go, normalizing it from from early on. Especially yeah. when you see your daughters and sons yeah. are getting a little older, yeah. they will be exposed to that information. Yeah. So the best thing you can do is try and make sure they have the right information. Information. Right. So actually, now that you talked about Beatrice Wafula. I think it's in, um, she also talks about the need for men to be involved. Yes. There's also an MHM uh, trainer. What's mm -hmm. his name? Is Let it me just get his name. Yeah, Josphat. Yes. And he says, I once asked a male teacher, mm -hmm. teacher, if you found that a girl was in her period, would you assist her? And he replied, God forbid, I do not know what I can do. Yeah. Um, and it goes back to your conversation about educators being a big, an integral part to this conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, but now I want to also dive into the men yes and the men you've got on the book you you have your dad, I have my dad. It's so <laughs> he's cute. the last story yeah the first, one of the first feminists i encountered in life was, yeah. my, fa was my father so. i love it and you know um, how that came about is yeah that i hadn't really told my family i i have this thing sharon where when i'm working on a really big project I they need didn't to say, know they don't know they didn't know they knew at the last minute um, <laughs> that's just how I am. Oh I'm my God. I just get so into it. Yeah. I don't want anything to, you know, derail. Yeah. So towards the end of it, my dad was like, okay, so can I read some of the material? He's a very good, um, writer and yeah. reader. He's a yeah. linguist. Yeah. And so he was going through and making little changes. I'm yeah. like, dad, do you want to be in the book? He's like, okay. Yeah. So I ended up having him as one I of the last it. contributors. So I'm really glad. And I also needed somebody who's like an older man. Yeah. So he became the older man. I, I love that it started with you and it ended with him. One oh, of the yeah. first feminists you've ever encountered. Yes. He congratulated you on your first day. He did. And he absolutely, you know, he kind of normalized it. And in mm -hmm. fact, now that we're talking about your dad, mm -hmm. he said something here.
goes back to how you know how we should start to deconstruct the mm -hmm. stigma and uh, taboos and yeah. and this is what he says and that's on page 229 yes. um, he says for adults still trapped in taboo and stigma society needs to keep gently hammering away by using available platforms including radio and television the church and the workplace mm -hmm. to perpetuate debate because some cultural norms are not easily overturned, this is likely to be a protracted war, but one that ultimately must be won through small gains and sheer persistence. Sounds like my dad. Yeah. <laughs> Big words. He's like, everybody is involved. <laughs> yes. You have to get everyone. And I yeah. love that media had a space. The workplace had a space. Yes. Um, how do you think the workplace yeah. can kind of contribute to this conversation? Because th that's a, one mm -hmm. of the, I mean, don't get me started on how mm -hmm. economically, like women especially are just not supported, whether it's mm -hmm. through um, maternity leave, sexual harassment. And I think, do, do you think that there's space mm -hmm. for that, for, period, uh, for periods to kind of... Um, yeah, I think be so, because one of the women I profile, um, you see there are many that I'm like, yeah. her name yeah. is, yeah. <laughs> okay, and then it will come to me yeah. later, but she, she was actually let go because uh. of missing, it eventually added up that she, because she had to keep taking days off, eventually the, she became a burden. Um, Elsie Wandera, who talks about endometriosis, luckily mm -hmm. for her, she's with a very savvy organization. She even runs like one, she's one of the people behind the Endometriosis Fund right. in Kenya Foundation. So she is lucky that she has the support. Sometimes she is hospitalized for days. Mm. It's something that she's really struggled with. She's very open about it. But in the case of other women, um, menstrual leave is now becoming a big conversation where the workplace has a role to play in understanding not everyone has the same period. And yes, some women are even fighting menstrual leave because they're like, oh, you're reducing us to our period. But other women are like, I need the menstrual yeah, leave yeah. because when I take two do days off work, I'm not skiving. Yeah. I'm literally bound by my pain yeah. and have to manage it before I'm able to be productive. Right. I think Egypt is the first country in Africa to um, approve menstrual leave. It's big in Asian countries. They get yeah. two, three days and it's normal. Um, so there is a place for the workplace for HR departments to understand and normalize and even have period products in the in the workplace in case yeah. of an emergency. It does need to be in the workplace. It is a conversation. Men need to empathize. Stop saying this thing for you're just being moody because you're on your period. Yeah. Let's understand that your colleagues have the same abilities, but sometimes because of this transition, there's certain challenges that may um, be affecting them, not necessarily limiting them, but affecting them. So mm. let's have the conversation in the workplace mm. as well. Mm. Yeah, and the role of men is crucial because they are the ones who perpetuate stigma. Right. Um, a lot of the time, when yeah. you look at societies, if you look at the workplace and the and places of worship, it's the man who's like, "You're dirty. Yeah. You cannot worship with us, or you cannot be with us." It's perpetuated, not limited by men. Some women also perpetuate the stigma. Yeah. So if we bring men on board as allies. They are, because we are in a patriarchal community and society, they are the gatekeepers of these uh, communities. Let's have them on board so that they can speak to their fellow men. Yeah. Men li will listen to them. Yeah. Um, and that's why having a pastor, having my father, having King Kaka, right. who is, you know, just having them say, we need to be allies. We need to multiply these allies. Neville is a very big MHM advocate. Yeah. He has trained people. Every time he's somewhere, women learn from him. Yeah. He'll drop gems and just talk about some of the things he's learning. And the other day in a conference, he says, I'm the product of a missed period. And everyone was like, yay. <laughs> <laughs> and he was the one saying, if this was a men's thing, he's like, yeah. let me tell you something. If men had their period, they'd be like gold plated pads. Oh, then no, we'd have figured it out. We'd have figured out no. everything. And he's like, it's the patriarchy. So why don't we bring these men and be, make them allies, make them understand so that we're just able to be very open about yeah, our conversations. Yeah. Yeah. And again, I, li I really like that you brought on even an imam into this conversation, the yes. most unlikely person that you would have anticipated exactly. to be talking about the period <laughs> yes. was there. And also it was to try and also mm -hmm. understand the stigma around or, you know, a lot of the stereotypes around the period and whether you are yeah. dirty and you know those conversations because that ultimately builds on exactly. stigma as well yes so i found it really interesting going through the book and seeing the selection of women you had and i was trying to like map them out every time i saw someone yeah. you know different or presented a different group i was like ah look at this yeah so you had women who are differently abled mm -hmm. you had women who 
who live with HIV, mm -hmm. Muslim women, Christian women, athletes, women who'd been behind bars mm -hmm. um, and living on the streets yes. as well. Why was that important to you? I mean, I, I almost want to answer this question. Yeah, I know I you're just like, asked it and I was like, <laughs> I know why she did it. Cause I, I, and I could see it as, as I was moving through the thread of the book. I was mm -hmm. like, this is genius. Yeah. But why was it important for you? I think the inclusion, I'm very big on inclusion um, and to an extent diversity. I think in 2020, you can't exactly be having certain conversations and locking out other groups, which tends to happen. And I don't, feel like there's room anymore to say I didn't know better. Uh, and so for me, it was important to understand everyone's experience. Yeah. We have a policy that has been approved by cabinet, right? The MHM policy. It's the first of its kind in the world. Wow. Kenya is leading in policy. We're the poster child for policy by the implementation <laughs> is a whole other game. Let's not even talk about yeah. implementation. So this policy has been, appro uh, has been approved. Um, I think it's been signed. We're just waiting for it to be launched. Like mm -hmm. everyone is just like, can you please launch it? Yeah. But the reason I bring that in is because we need to make sure it's a holistic, inclusive, um, you know, kind of policy that includes everyone. Mm. I've been, I've seen it. I've been able to kind of view it, and I know that they include differently able people. But already I was poking holes and saying, I don't see what it says about women who are incarcerated, yeah. teen moms, because yeah. if you're distributing pads and panties to girls in public schools, you're leaving out that girl who is her age mate, but not in school. Yeah. I haven't really seen that, but I'm still um, looking at it. So this book was supposed to highlight like, hey, let's show you who menstruates. Yeah. It is everyone who menstruates and it's people with different, in different backgrounds, with different abilities, in different settings who menstruate. Yeah. And they can also draw on the policy gaps. The woman, the girl who was in the streets, Veronica, she's, she's the youngest girl in the book. She's oh. 16. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to have anybody under 18 in the book yeah. just to protect them. But she's like, no, 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 I, I want to do it. Yeah. And uh, she's now in a football academy. Wow. And she was like, yeah, I grew up in the street. Imagine she's 16 and she's talking about when I grew up in the streets, wow. when she was 11, 12 and seeing friends of hers having sex with pads and yeah. everything. Teresa, who was in Langata Women's Prison, talking about women who are incarcerated being reduced to begging for pads. Right, sharing an Share, underwear. Sharing an underwear. Tearing pages from their Bible to use as uh, pads. So that was just, it. Yeah. yeah, women who are blind. Yeah. You know, women who... Differently abled and sort of having to go to the toilet. And it, honestly, that made me feel so yeah. embarrassed. Yeah. Um, if I've ever, for the moments that I, I'm going to confess, I may have gone into it, um, the disability bathrooms and maybe not really paid attention to it and thought, yeah. what does it mean for someone who yeah. is differently abled and will need to hold the toilet? Or yes. Just, you know, and, sit, and imagine how or the they, floor, I sit on the floor. Some yeah. of them are like, we have to sit. So she's yeah. like, we can't use public spaces because yeah. people don't consider us. That. They're filthy also. Yeah. So we can't. And one of the people whose stories really, really touched me is Ingrid and, and Sharon and Ingrid is living with Down syndrome. So we also uh, don't think about special mother and needs. Daughter. Mother and daughter. Right, yeah, we don't yeah. think about special needs. Because she said that's a whole other ball game, right. Janet. Trying yeah, to yeah. trying to make your daughter who has special needs yeah. understand what's happening. Yeah. That got me by the way. I was I was very teary eyed. Yeah. And she's uh, her mom is a huge advocate for special needs. Uh, she's like, we just we're nowhere. We're not featured in any form anywhere. We're just like the invisible folks. Right. So me trying to walk my daughter through it was really difficult. Mm. Trying to get to the place where she's not removing this pad because it's, why is that there? Yeah. She doesn't really understand. Right. And so for me, it was important that we look at a very diverse group of people and find out what intervention looks like for them. And I loved it. I saw it as I was moving through it and I was like, you are just genius okay. and bless Thank you. you. Okay. It's uh, so funny. There are a couple of people who read the book and they're like, first time sex? I know. <laughs> or saw the cover yes. and I was like, not that juicy. Sorry, son. Sorry, son. Yeah. <laughs> Next <laughs> version. Next, Next version. Oh, yes. Yes. Right? I support that book. <laughs> and we can also start to get into that conversation. Yes. But for now, let's talk periods. It's, it's really problematic. And we've even touched on this before. Not really having laws around MHM and mm -hmm. kind of pushing forward that these policies are not just there, but are implemented. Mm -hmm. um, but also that there are policies that kind of speak to what goes into mm -hmm. the sanitary towel and the pad. And I think it is, uh, 
Is it Washuka? Yeah, Washuka yes, Thimba. Washuka. Yes. Who calls it moon time? She calls her period moon time. And I was like, what is this like elevated yes. version she of like an awareness of self? A completely spiritual yeah. experience. Yeah. I to, love it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, and she says, research has found that there is no law in the world that requires manufacturers of menstrual products to list what they put in the product. Mm -hmm. And last year we had mm -hmm. um, a, a brand confronted on Twitter by Kenyan women yes and African women actually there was a lot of a lot of women kind yeah. of chimed in to say mm -hmm. no mm -hmm. no we, we reject the product that you put into the market because mm -hmm. the of the plastic and the products they just don't sit well they lead to itch and uh, issues and mm -hmm. and we deserve better yes what are your thoughts around mm -hmm. that um, you know whether it's yeah what goes into the product mm -hmm. and maybe even moving from that a little how to dispose of it and mm. the different options of pads, the cups and that's true. Um, cloth. Ooh, period choice. Yeah. It's it's a it's a big conversation. Going back to uh, the conversation that was big last year, I'm really happy that we have the space and the voice to say, I deserve better. To your sentence. Yeah. Fantastic. Um and in as much as you know there's there's conversations for improvement ETC, at least now brands are aware you cannot bring substandard or have products in the market and assume everyone will take it mm. as it comes. Um, lessons have been learned, which mm. is fantastic. I still feel like there needs to be a better education to Ashuka's point on why are some of these things kept from us? Mm. Why don't we deserve to know? Mm. And that's a, it's a global debate, by the way. Women in the US are asking for it. Women in the UK are asking for it. It's up to companies to declare and to say, we are okay saying what's in the product and we're telling you it's safe for you. Mm. That's a conversation that's going on and I think it's just going to become a lot more uh, persistent. So I'm I, really, yeah. and it's important. Can you imagine if they weren't telling us what we're putting on our hair or skin? And yes. now they have to list what's, what ingredients there are. And honestly, it's but a matter of time. You, it's a matter yeah, of time. Yeah. The good thing is, the fact that we're even having this conversation on national TV, yeah. that there's books, that there's docu-series, that right. for me, that's like a huge win. It's a matter of time before they say, okay, we're ready. Yeah. Um, and so it's, I know it's a really big conversation. Even in terms of period choice, um, and, I, I, and I know I talk about it in part of the research for the book, there's washable or reusable pads, there's yeah. the menstrual cups. I believe everybody should have a choice. Yeah. Like there's this thing called the menstrual hygiene lab. As a trainer, um, one of the things that we do is open the training with a lab and we call it a lab, but it's basically like a shuka or a lesso on the floor and you put all the period products out there, okay. um, including applicators and tampons and cups and, and pieces of cloth. Yeah. And then it's always like a conversation starter. Women and girls are like, what's going on? What is this? And you'll see people pick up. And then we say, these are period product choices from around, like, especially right. the ones which are in Kenya. Yeah. Make people aware. I think anything that gives women and girls the ability to menstruate with dignity, I'm all for it. Mm -hmm. The thing about cups and washables is there's a, women who are doing incredible work in Kenya, Ebi with the gray scarf and a lot of people with washable. Yeah. Um, and I'm always asking them, what happens in terms of water, sanitation? Because with the cup, uh, you have to wash right. it yeah, yeah, and yeah. boil it. Yeah, yeah. So it's not easily accessible or usable to everyone yeah. for that. But I also want to say in the same light, disposable pads are also problematic because of the hygiene yeah. and sanitation. And, yeah. And the, also disposal, if you're thinking of an environment, I think it takes like 300 years for, for it to, for it to, to for decompose. decompose, which is yeah. horrible. Yeah. So bottom line is we need to allow period choices to be met with access to um, clean water, hygienic and safe disposal and sanitation. Yeah. Do you know what it will take, Sharon? It'll take like concerted effort of like the environment ministry, water, sanitation, yeah. health, education. I'm like, please come together and help us better create the environment that we deserve. Mm. So disposable pads are what people are used to when you go to schools, ETC, but they also say, Janet, we leave our pads and it's just a mess. Mm. And our neighbors find it problematic. And everybody just is so disgusted because we don't have anywhere to throw them. Yeah. So they're out in the open. And that's something that we find is um, an indignity to us. Yeah. Our neighbors can't stand it. 
The cups, they'll tell me, would be ideal because then it's a private way for me to manage it. But where am I going to store it? Right. How am I going to wash, wash it? it. Yeah. The washable pads, they're called, they're called reusable, but it's better known as washable in some parts. Yeah are also great, but some girls, because of shame, wash them and put them under the mattress. So you're Which not even drying dry. it, yeah. then it gives you an infection. Yeah. So can we just, first of all, allow people to have the choice? Let's stop, let's stop hoarding yeah. towards one. Whatever parents feel is safe for their daughters, especially for really young girls, yeah. let's find a way to facilitate the better and safe use of these products. Yeah. That's the dream. That is the dream, is that people will have the facilities around them to use these products. But right now, if disposable is what government is pushing for, please include bins and incinerators, which are being fought left, right, and center. Yeah. But I'm like, these are ways in which we can address yeah. the disposal. So it's still a very big conversation. Right. I'm, I'm glad you've raised the question because it's a very big component yeah. of menstrual health management. Yeah, and you know, as you were just listing the different options available, it took me back to one of the um, women who shares her story. Mm. And she, I think she was the oldest. We've talked about the youngest who's 16. Yeah. But I want to be, I want to say she yeah. was the oldest. Is it Tumpesia? The one who's in Masai? the... Yes, that's, yes she's, she's, the she, she's the oldest. She's the oldest. Because she said, by the time she realized mm. that pads were available mm. she already was on menopause yes she did not know for for her li for her life yeah. most of her life she, she did know. not know what a wasn't that incredible was. and i just yes you stand as you know and yeah she things did. you take for granted things we take for um, granted so yeah. information isn't reaching yeah. areas where it should right yeah. exactly so Page 237, and yes. this is now like the appendix, the, ed, the yes. you know, end bits of the book. Mm -hmm. You talk about the uh, economics of menstruation. Mm -hmm. And I loved that you put a figure to it. Yes. Because for the most part, and especially in like more marginalized communities, this mm -hmm. is what is stopping girls from mm -hmm. uh, going to school, mm -hmm. having, you know, getting getting men who ask for sex in exchange for this mm -hmm. um kind of mothers or fathers who just have no time to spend yeah what was that figure eventually a hundred and yeah. eighty a month or something and like breaking that? it down right that it's it down. it's like milk or bread yeah. or maize why would i buy a sanitary right. pad yeah. for you yeah yeah and so a lot of households will tell you i would rather feed my children yeah and my daughter stays back and then they'll say things like, I went through that. And so it's repeating the cycle of poverty. Right. Because again, pricing of sanitary products, in as much as the uh, excise duty has been lifted, it has not reflected in the pricing. Yeah. So you still find that 50 bob, which is one, one of the lower prices in the market, yeah. is still very, very unaffordable. High. It's very, very high. high. And they'll tell you with that, this is what yeah. I can do in my home. Yeah. Why would I use that for pads? Yeah. She'll figure it out. Yeah. I did. Yeah. you know and that's and it's hard i mean i even i don't know how you make a mother choose or and I, i'm saying mother but also father yeah do you feed your child do you kind of get them to go to school do you buy pads like there's of all the things that you need to figure out where to spend yeah. your money it's a difficult choice for someone to make and that's why going yeah. back to what you're saying mm -hmm. that's even like as governments are trying to cons you know make sure that girls in school mm -hmm. in public schools have access to pads also consider mm -hmm. the girls who didn't end up going to school because exactly of, and know, let's and that. for me the pain is why are we why does it have to be a choice yeah, yeah. these products should be we need to find a way as somebody said in a conference I, I hosted the other day, mm. an amazing lady called Lucy uh, Nashu, and she came from Kajad, and she's like, pa condoms are everywhere, yeah. and some of them are freely available. Yeah. This is something I don't have a choice over. Why do I still have right. to choose? Yeah. Um, I know that in some campuses in the U.S., they're now um, availing sanitary products for students for free, mm -hmm. and it's going to take a while. But honestly, for the love of God, can we just find a way to make these products easily accessible? Because we should not have to choose. Yeah. A mother and father should not have to choose food over pads. Let's avail the pads. Let's avail the products. Let's find a way to create access. Yeah. That's the only way we'll do away with the cycle of poverty and crime and all of these issues that come about because of period poverty. Yeah. Yes. Oh, wow. Yeah. Janet. No, I'm not done. I'm no. not ready. Are you You're chasing me? No. Are you ready? I'm okay, here. Okay, fine. I'm I'm gonna, we've, got, we've got a couple more minutes, okay. actually. And that, I think now, I w will ask, like, I'm just curious to know, yes. what are you currently reading? Um, I like the way it's like somebody can be like, I'm reading this and I'm like, Sharon has busted me yeah. because I'm not currently. Because <laughs> you're busy. Because I'm tour. like, I'm busy on my book tour, so yeah. I'm not reading. Um, okay, so and I can literally see it on my bedside. Yeah. Um, it's called New Power. Oh, okay. It's okay. called New Power. 
Um, I'm usually good with the title and not the author, but this yeah. book is incredible. I think it's one of those books everyone should read because oh. it talks about the change from the old guard to the new. Mm. Um, they even started by citing campaigns that have shifted this world, like Me Too. Oh. And this book says, we can't avoid this new shift and new power yeah. that's about co-creation and about giving the power back to people. Right. Old power is about, I get to make the decisions, I'm the gatekeeper, yeah. you guys just listen. Yeah. It is fantastic. It will even give you ideas on how to interact um, on, this, on the social media space, even in the workplace when dealing with new power, which is again, the new way of thinking, whether yeah. it's millennials thinking, ETC, it's an incredibly powerful tool that I think employers all need to have by their bedside, government needs to read yeah. it, everyone needs to stop avoiding the power in co-creating and in inviting those who are locked out. I recently also read Moment of Lift by Melinda Gates. Okay. She talks about the same thing. Stop locking people out. Yeah. So I love those themes of I love inclusion, and new power. Yeah. Yeah. And in this day and age, and yeah. especially with social media, just because you are an untouchable, <laughs> yeah. like whether like government official does not mean that you are you know yeah. outside of And of you'll reach. be held accountable. Yeah. Yeah, and that's exactly. what new power is about. It's about yeah. like you now need to work with these folks because they will still come back to hold you oh, accountable. Yeah. So oh, it's yeah. my current read, oh, that's good. <laughs> New Power. Yes. And what book in 2019 had the greatest impact or did you enjoy the most? What would be? We're going to need more wine. Oh, <laughs> I love Gabriel that. Union. Also, it almost sounded like you were saying we're going to need more oh. wine before because it took I a like, second for me yeah, to be like, You're wine. like, why is Janet? <laughs> why are we on wine now? But yes, Fantastic Gabriel book. Union. You know why oh. I loved it? And you're very good at this, Sharon. You're good at talking about um, the ability to be imperfect. Uh, it's not an ability, what am yeah, I saying? Yeah, Being yeah. imperfect yeah. and vulnerable. <laughs> right. I love material like that where she breaks down as a woman her vulnerable moments, her mm -hmm. moments of power, her moments of coming into her own. I feel like as an individual, that's something I'm really awakening to as yeah. a woman. I'm really feeling good about the space I'm transitioning yeah. into now, which is like, it's okay to say I'm a feminist. It's okay to be a feminist, but be raising two sons. It's mm. okay. And it's necessary because they also need to, uh, to be aware about this incredible thing called humanity that they have a responsibility to protect. Yeah. So I loved that book so much. Um, and I loved The Bigger Deal by Sunny Bindra, who's a Kenyan. Oh, oh that yeah. book is really good. We hosted him, um, I think <laughs> yeah. it was a year before though, mm -hmm. and went through that book. It's that book, right? Yes, I think so it that must it's be most because recent it's, his, book, it's his most recent most book. Most recent book. And we went through, yeah. and that's the one that's talking about like um, yeah. your passion, your, your purpose. Your bigger purpose, yeah, yeah like I, your bigger deal. Yes, deal. yeah. So those two kind of stayed in my mind for 2019. Oh. I liked the balance of the, the femini femininity and evolution of person that was Gabriel Union. Yeah. And then I liked how Sunny Bindra was like, why are you here? Yeah. Like what exactly what is, is your, your purpose? purpose on this earth? Yeah. So I ki kind of carry that forward. But now it's just like thinking about um, femini feminism, but also inclusion, feminism and leadership, how to integrate it in the workplace. It's yeah. complex, but it's an exciting conversation. Oh, yes. Janet, and you? Am I, I allowed so to ask much you? Love. Oh, what am I breeding now? <laughs> yeah. Um, You're a very avid reader. Yeah, yeah. or oh, I'm trying to be. Okay. Well, I just finished my, my first time. time. Yes. I'm not going to lie, I finished it yesterday. Okay. I wouldn't <laughs> judge like, you. Power read, power read quickly. I wouldn't really. judge you here. I have to make sure I have to like <laughs> get everything. Of course, I read like a couple of stories. Yes. But I, I knew, and I knew it was going to be on my um, yes, must list. read book. Okay. But the book I just also um, mm -hmm. finished uh finished reading and it just completely changed my perspective and I love books for that that yes. it kind of shifts your yes. thinking and pushes you out of your comfort zone is 40 rules of love oh um, I don't know if you've read it but I've heard about yeah. it but I haven't read it and it just for me now it's it got me asking questions about um, the ego mm -hmm. Islam and wanting uh -huh. to understand it a little bit better mm -hmm. just just because I thought mm -hmm. here is someone who has dismantled mm -hmm. the idea of Again, going back to power and I am in charge mm -hmm. and I am your spiritual leader and I am the only way that you can access yeah. your relationship with God. And he was like, For forget that. God is here. And that. But in, in a very like um, mm. conversation, like a very interesting tone. Yeah. Those are important books to read. Yeah. Um, um, and of course, the other book I'm reading is my first time. But I the wanted to time. mention, there's <laughs> yeah. a journal. Um, oh, yes. Because I want people to be able to draw or write or just outline their own experience. Yeah. So some people have been sending me like, I've, I've drawn my first time. Others are like, I'm writing it oh, out. So nice. um, 
And uh, yeah. yeah, but but to your point, just reading books that shift perspective and ask you to question more and challenge more and challenge notions that we've been made to believe yeah. that that just there's no more permission for that. Yeah. It's like I need to challenge you. Yeah. You can't be saying you're the only you're the all. Right. You know, you're the all, inc you know, the all power. All and knowing. All knowing. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. It, it, you need to be able to engage me. I'm yeah. human. Yeah. At the very least, I deserve a chance to um, air my views yeah. and and lend my voice. And so when I see a lot of war of words online, yeah. a lot of it you'll find, stay in your place, oh, or you're just stay, complaining. Right. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. I'm like, you can't ask me to be quiet. I literally have permission to say what's on my mind. Yeah. And you saying that means you have to unlearn who gets to speak and who doesn't. Right. And it's this back, you just have to be, are you ready to unlearn and learn new ways? If you're ready, come, let's have a conversation. Yeah. But if you're bashing me, calling me a feminazi or whatever it yeah. is, you're not ready to unlearn. When you're ready, come. We'll have Ooh, tea. Janet. <laughs> we'll have a couple. Janet, <laughs> Thanks, Sharon. Thank you. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm so excited that we get to start this off, um, yeah. this series, which is um, our book club series, right. and that we get to start it off with a Kenyan author, Yay. a female author, yeah. and that being you, about a topic that I think Mm -hmm. is way overdue and yeah. i'm so happy that you're doing this outside of even the book that you know your work is, yes. is in line with this as well so thank you and i wish you all the best thank you sharon thank you love. this oh, was great bless you um <laughs> Thank you for watching, everybody. Remember, if you haven't already, you can pick this up at Textbook Center. That's correct, right? That's correct. It'll be available countrywide very soon. It's available oh, in a okay. few counties. Okay, okay. Um, but countrywide soon. But right now, Textbook Center in Nairobi. Okay. Textbook Center. Pick it up. I love it. Mm -hmm. I love the conversations that we've had about this mm -hmm. book today. Um, and also, if you have any suggestions on books that you would like us to get into later in this year, or if you would like to be part of this discussion, we'd have loved to have one of you guys here and we talk through this book as well. It would have been really interesting to get one of your fans going through this. Um, so if you would like to be part of one of our shows in the future, make sure you hit us up on social media. That's Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. It's Living With This across all platforms. Send us a DM and just be like, I'm in. I'm coming. Tell me where and when, and we will. Um, but for now, I'm gonna love you and leave you. We were at the beautiful Hop House. It's my first time here and it's stunning. A must visit. Janet and I, and I were like, this is where we're coming next <laughs> for our overdue lunch yeah. date. But I'll see you tomorrow. Thanks everybody. Bye. Thank you, Janet. Oh.